I want to read about a law, and it's called the Law of Reversibility. And it is spoken of by Neville Goddard in his book called Resurrection. And Neville gets a lot of his uh, information from the Bible. But this information could be metaphysical as well as biblical. It's, it's a, a understanding. It's really, in a way, a kind of a scientific understanding, too. And so don't let the fact that he quotes the Bible a little, a little bit in this turn anyone away that doesn't necessarily think the Bible is the best source. There's some jewels in that Bible. And there's some things I wouldn't dare believe as well. But just know that this is an important, very important law, this law of reversibility. And the practice of it, if we could do that, I think about myself. If I could completely do it, I could completely transform my life. It helps us to learn how to deal with issues of fear and anger and uh, revenge and all those things because these are the kind of things that we have to use a controlled imagination in order to not let that shape our lives or the life of our country or our world. And on every hand, it seems right now, there is so much fear-mongering so much uh, less do this so they won't do that talk even by our politicians who don't seem to want to keep us out of war and so i just want to stress the importance of understanding this law of reversibility so i will read it now there is nothing to change but our concept of self as soon as we succeed in transforming self our world will dissolve and reshape itself in harmony with that which our change affirms. Prayer. Prayer is the master key. A key may fit one door of a house, but when it fits all doors, it may well claim to be a master key. Such and no less a key is prayer to all earthly problems. Now, Law of Reversibility. Prayer is an art and requires practice. The first requirement is a controlled imagination. Parody and vain repetitions are foreign to prayer. Its exercise requires tranquility and peace of mind. Use not vain repetitions, for prayer is done in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. The ceremonies that are customarily used in prayer are mere superstitions and have been invented to give prayer an air of solemnity. Those who do practice the art of prayer are often ignorant of the laws that control it. They attribute <clears throat> the results obtained to the ceremonies and the mistake they mistake the letter for the spirit. The essence of prayer is truth, but faith must be permitted with understanding to be given that active quality which it does not possess when standing alone. Therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting get understanding. This book is an attempt to reduce the unknown to the known by pointing out the conditions on which prayers are answered and without which they cannot be answered. It defines the conditions governing prayers in laws that are simply a generalization of our observations. The universal law of reversibility is the foundation on which its claims are based. Now for a little scientific talk here. Mechanical motion caused by speech was known for a long time before anyone dreamed of the possibility of an inverse transformation, that is, the reproduction of speech by mechanical motion, the phonograph. For a long time, electricity was produced by friction without ever a thought that friction, in turn, could be produced by electricity. Whether or not man succeeds in reversing the transformation of a force, he knows, nevertheless, that all transformations of force are reversible. If heat can produce mechanical motion, so mechanical motion can produce heat. 
If electricity produces magnetism, magnetism too can develop electric current. If the voice can cause undulatory currents, so can such currents reproduce the voice, and so on, cause and effect, energy and matter, action and reaction, are the same and interconvertible. This law is of the highest importance because it enables you to foresee the inverse transformation once the direct transformation is verified. If you know how you would feel were you to realize your objective, then inversely, you would know what state you could realize were you to awaken in yourself such feeling. The injunction to pray believing that you already possess what you pray for is based upon a knowledge of the law of inverse transformation. If your realized prayer produces in you a definite feeling or state of consciousness, then inversely that particular feeling or state of consciousness must produce your realized prayer. Because all transformations of force are reversible, you should always assume the feeling of your fulfilled wish. You should awaken within you the feeling that you are and have that which heretofore you desired to be and to possess. This is easily done by contemplating the joy that would be yours were your objective and accomplished fact, so that you live and move and have your being in the feeling that your wish is, is realized. The feeling of the wish fulfilled, if assumed and sustained, must objectify the state that would have created it. This law explains why faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and why he calleth things that are not seen as though they were, and things that were not seen become seen. Assume the feeling of your wish fulfilled, and continue feeling that it is fulfilled until that which you feel objectifies itself. If a physical fact can produce a psychological state, <clears throat> a psychological state can produce a physical fact. If the effect A can be produced in the cause B, then inversely the effect B can be, be produced in the cause A. There I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you have received them, and you shall have them. Dual Nature of Consciousness A clear concept of the dual nature of man's consciousness must be the basis of all true prayer. Consciousness includes a subconscious as well as a conscious part. The infinitely greater part of consciousness lies below the sphere of objective consciousness. The subconscious is the most important part of consciousness. It is the cause of voluntary action. The subconscious is what man, what a man is. The conscious is what a man knows. I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I. The conscious and subconscious are one, but the subconscious is greater than the conscious. I of myself can do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the work. Objective consciousness of myself can do nothing. The Father, the subconscious, he doeth the work. The subconscious is that in which everything is known, in which everything is possible, to which everything goes, from which everything comes, which belongs to all, to which all have access. What we are conscious of is constructed out of what we are not conscious of. Not only do our subconscious assumptions influence our behavior, but they also fashion the pattern of our objective existence. They alone have the power to say, let us make man objective manifestation in our image after our likeness. The whole of creation is asleep within the deep of man and is awakened to objective existence by his subconscious assumptions. Within that blankness we call sleep, there is a consciousness in unsleeping vigilance, 
And while the body sleeps, this unsleeping being releases from the treasure house of eternity the subconscious assumptions of man. Prayer is the key which unlocks the infinite storehouse. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Prayer modifies or completely changes our subconscious assumptions. And a change of assumption is a change of expression. The conscious mind reasons inductively from observation, experience, and education. It therefore finds it difficult to believe what the five senses and inductive reason deny. The subconscious reasons deductively and is never concerned with the truth or falsity of the premise, but proceeds on the assumption of the correctness of the premise and objectifies results which are consistent with the premise. This distinction must be clearly seen by all who would master the art of prayer. No true grasp of the science of prayer can be really obtained until the laws governing the dual nature of consciousness are understood and the importance of the subconscious is realized. Prayer, the art of believing what is denied by the senses, deals almost entirely with the subconscious. Through prayer, the subconscious is suggested into acceptance of the wish fulfilled and reasoning deductively logically unfolds it to its legitimate end. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The subjective mind is the diffused consciousness that animates the world. It is the spirit that giveth life. In all substance is a single soul, subjective mind. Through all creation runs the one unbroken, unbroken subjective mind. Thought and feeling fused into beliefs impress modifications upon it, charge it with a mission, which mission it faithfully executes. The conscious mind originates premises. The subjective mind unfolds them to their logical end. Were the subjective mind not so limited, limited in its initiative power of reasoning, objective man could not be held responsible for his actions in the world. Man transmits ideas to the subconscious through his feelings. The subconscious transmits ideas from mind to mind through telepathy. Your unexpressed convictions of others are transmitted to them without their conscious knowledge or consent, and if subconsciously accepted by them, will influence their behavior. The only ideas they subconsciously reject are your ideas of them, which they could not wish to be true of anyone. Whatever they, would, they could wish for others can be believed of them, and by the law of belief which governs subjective reasoning, they are compelled to subjectively accept and therefore objectively express accordingly. The subjective mind is completely controlled by suggestion. Ideals are best suggested when the objective mind is partly subjective, that is, when the objective senses are diminished or held in abeyance. This partly subjective state can best be described as controlled reverie, wherein the mind is passive but capable of functioning with absorption. It is a concentration of attention. There must be no conflict in your mind when you are praying. Turn from what is to what ought to be. Assume the mood of fulfilled desire, and by the universal law of reversibility, you will realize your desires. imagination and faith. Prayers are not successfully made until there is rapport between the conscious and subconscious mind of the operator. This is done through imagination and faith. By the power of imagination, all men, certainly imaginative men, are forever casting forth enchantments, and all men, especially unimaginative men, are continually passing under their power. Can we even 
ever be certain that it was not our mother while darning our socks who began that subtle change in our minds? If I can unintentionally cast an enchantment over persons, there is no reason to doubt that I am able to cast intentionally a far stronger enchantment. Everything that can be seen, touched, explained, argued over is to the imaginative is to the imaginative man nothing more than a means, for he functions by reason of his controlled imagination. In the deep of himself, where every ideal exists in itself and not in relation to something else, in him there is no need for the restraints of reason, for the only restraint he can obey is the mysterious instinct that teaches him to eliminate all moods other than the mood of fulfilled desire. Now, I I do read this book, Resurrection, on my website. You can find it in my playlist in its entirety. But I do want to emphasize that there is a battle going on for the mind of man. And I can just about assure you that those who desire to put into your mind fear, anger, resentment, revenge, those kind of things, they're not working for your good. And a lot of times people, well-meaning people, and people who see themselves as very religious, sometimes will be encouraging distrust of this. And, and, and this law teaches that whatever you can imagine of another If that person can imagine it of you, then that can hurt him. But if he can't imagine this way himself, and this goes on further to say that, then what you imagine of him is like a ball that bounces right off of him and comes back and and settles in yourself instead of him. So be careful what you think of another person because it might come back to haunt you especially if he's not capable of thinking of you or thinking that same thought about you or about anyone else. Which teaches me that we we shouldn't hate or we shouldn't judge any other person. Not even the one that is taunting us or anyone else whatsoever. It's completely love your enemy and be good to him who persecutes you and despitefully uses you. That is not a weak thing to do. That is a very strong thing, and it's hard to do. I I, I admit, it's very hard to do. But it's very necessary that we do it. We have a lot of reason in our world today for one group of people to think they have a righteous need to hate and distrust others. But we've got to let go of that. And... Think of it this way. Wouldn't you rather be known for what you were for than be known for what you were against? So work for that what you're for. Kind of put these people that you're against what they think. Well, you can inform people like, you know, newsmen have to do, but you don't have to vilify and demonize the other one. You don't have to say this is a communist or a Nazi or these people are needing to have their heads chopped off or what you don't need to go that far just inform people and let them make their own decision and quit trying to teach fear and and revenge and hatred because that will get us exactly nowhere not into anything good for ourselves or for our world or for the earth for our future it all depends on us being able to use this law of reversibility and use it for our good and the good of all. And thank you for listening to me. This is the Dove Lady, over and out.